Hello, people. The name is George. The last name is Zorgopoulos. I call myself a controls engineer. And for the last few months, I've been a new member of the RD Pilot developer team. Um, I work for myself, and you can all already tell I'm doing this wrong. I don't have any company logos, no contact details, nothing. Uh, this presentation is not going to be to be very long, so maybe I could start with some. Uh, Dotling. So in my previous life, I was a PhD student and researcher and was writing and presenting papers for IEEE conferences, uh, cutting edge research, all of all of that fancy stuff. Uh, but so a few months ago when I learned about this conference, I said, okay, I've kind of missed this. Let's let's try to do this again. Um, I thought, yeah, let's not get too rusty on writing papers. Set a few goals for myself. Uh, keep the IEEE conference vibes streak live. Maybe take advantage of all that, all those long hours I spent on graduate courses and put them to good work and try to contribute maybe some proofs, some formal proofs for the RD pilot controllers. Both you and me are in for disappointment. <laughs> so this is not by any means peer reviewed paper. Nope. Uh, I wrote this is not a Triple E conference as a bad thing two weeks ago, but in hindsight, no, it's actually better. So that's an upside. I realized I don't remember nearly half, maybe quarter as much from <laughs> what I learned like all those years ago. <laughs> and finally, uh, yeah, proofs, formal proofs for real vehicle con controllers, eh, you're not going to find those exactly in this presentation. So let's revise our goals and let's try instead to have some fun. And remember that research is hard on your body. Try to take breaks when you're, uh, you plan to do long hours on a chair. All right, so let's get into the main course uh, and feel free to ask questions whenever, it's fine. Uh, we heard today and yesterday about a lot of nice tooling we are developing for linear systems. We have FFTs, we have Bode diagrams. Uh, we now uh, heard today about uh, more and more uh, tools to uh, tune our linear controllers. PID is a linear controller, by the way, uh, and all that good stuff. There are some parts of our system that are not linear, though. And Nathaniel did a good hint at, at this, uh, that trike, it was not behaving linearly exactly. So when does this linear assumption break down? It's either when the plant, the system is nonlinear. And I have here an example of uh, the altitude rate as a function of velocity and pitch angle. And the other case when the linear assumption breaks down is when your controller is nonlinear. And you know what is hitting both of these? Tex. So Tex as a system model does not assume a linear plant and its inner workings are not linear. So we have ourselves a nonlinear system and our linear tools don't work on this, right? So we have um, a mid, mid 20th century control problem here. And who do you turn to when you have one of these? To a like 19th century Russian mathematicians most of the time. So the go-to guy for today is Alexander Lyapunov. Uh, he was born in 1857. So it's not exactly cutting edge research we're doing here. Uh, to an astronomer dad, nice. And he was a student of Chebyshev, for those who care about those kind of things. He is considered the father of stability theory in dynamic systems. But yeah, I don't speak Russian. 
So who do we turn to to explain the ECU? And the go-to bi bibliography for today is an Egyptian-American, Hassan Khalil, who wrote, and, and he, this guy is still alive. Retired, though, but still alive. <laughs> and uh, he's written this marvelous book, who is like the go-to textbook for all things nonlinear. Um, there are literally thousands of publications for in conferences and journals and monographs about how do you tackle and analyze nonlinear systems, but specifically for the autopilot controllers, I couldn't find any. If you have any references, please point me to them, and they, that would be really lovely. Uh, but that means that I kind of started from scratch. And uh, that said, let's kind of revise our goals then. So... For today, what I want to show is whether text closes a stable loop. We know from the outcome that it does. And try to uncover any hints on tuning text based on what we're going to say today. So as with any control problem, we'll start with our model. For this, we're going to need only our longitudinal airplane dynamics. We're going to assume a really good pitch tracking for today. We're going to use a very simplified thruster model. It's that FT times delta T, like constant force modulated with our throttle signal. And a drag model that is not the simplest one. It's just complicated to be useful, perhaps. We could do, oops, we could do simpler. We could do more complicated. It's like midway there. And we are going to limit ourselves to a regulation problem. Basically, how do you take a constant altitude and speed reference set point and try to track that? We're not going to go through climbs and dives and this kind of transitions. On the controller side, uh, text is, the text.cpp file is around 700 lines of code, maybe more. So I had to do an interpretation uh, to distill everything into simple, simpler equations. And this is why, Bill, I asked you, how easy was it for you for the PID counterparts? Uh, so the, I started drawing my own well, like diagrams on Draw.io. And this is an example of uh, how you get the uh, inputs to text and construct the velocity set points. And it got out of our hand pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. So you will need to trust me on this for today that I did a good job, like keeping the essentials of text. Yeah. Like I said, it's not peer reviewed. Uh, but for today's analysis, we also need to come up with a so-called autonomous system. An autonomous system is a dynamic system that doesn't have any input. It has a state, and that state evolves according to those dynamics. And we, to do that, we take our plant. That plant does have some inputs. We substitute for the controller equations through that closed loop. And the autonomous system is the outside view of that pair. Yeah, that doesn't look very manageable either. Um, but still, it is something we can grab onto and see where it leads us. The next thing that we need to do is to find the equilibrium points of that autonomous system, basically see where it wants to settle. Uh, these are points basically where if you place the system states there, the system will not move. There are uh, stable points, let's say that. Uh, stable is not the best word. There are points uh, more accurately that where the derivatives don't change. Uh, sorry, they state zero. Some of 
those points can be stable, some of those can be unstable. In this case, we'll see that it is a stable point. And indeed, when we try to solve for zero derivatives, we get the velocity and altitude set points, which is a good thing. It means that um, the text can stabilize that uh, system on the desired set points. And we can see the bottom two integrator states that they need to wind up to the expected values to keep that uh, system stuck there. The next thing that we need to do to apply our theory is to translate the state coordinates around zero. You noticed earlier that the altitude and the velocity are not zero. We don't want to fly our airplane at zero altitude and it can't fly at zero airspeed, but really we need to basically substitute uh, the arbitrary altitude and velocity set points uh, to a trim point. We substitute that trim po point from our states and yeah, we have a new frame of reference where the zero is our desired state. Um, most stability analyses assume that stability, that the desired stability is at the origin, but that's fine. It doesn't break anything. It doesn't mean that, that it's not applicable. It's, it, it works just fine. It's just a mathematical trick that we do to generalize our approach. And this is where linear analysis uh, needs to come and assist us a bit uh, to show that this, uh, this trim point is actually stable. So we go through the usual steps of linear, linearizing the nonlinear system on the trim point and try to get a stability assessment. And this is basically what you see here. It's a state transition matrix on the top. It has the P, uh, sorry, the um, uh, text parameters left in as uh, variables. I substituted the rest of the uh, variables, masses, drags, etc., with numbers. Still, it's kind of hard to tell if that top um, matrix is a stable system. So I went ahead for this example and substituted with actual numbers of, of which you can get some eigenvalues. You can see that all the real parts are negative. So we are happy. This system is going to be a stable one. This stream point is stable. So we can start now our nonlinear analysis knowing that this trim point, yeah, eventually it's stable. We can try to see how it behaves. And at this point, we can do sort of an intermission and talk about how does the system actually evolve around that stable point. And these are some uh, trajectories, essentially, of a two-state system, looking at it from top down, you can think that horizontally that's uh, altitude, vertically it's um, uh, speed, for example. And this, the, the, the arrows on the line show what, what happens to the system, how it evolves if you let it and you start it from an arbitrary point on that plane. For a stable uh, origin, you see that from whenever, wherever you leave it on that plane, it will eventually draw a trajectory that will lead it at zero and stay at zero. If it was a saddle point, so-called saddle point, it would converge on one state, on the vertical state, but it would diverge on the other horizontal state. Or it could be a focus point describing circles around those that two state system eventually ending up at the origin, but through some oscillation. Or it could be a center, basically circling around that center, but never actually minimizing the error to zero. And there are some more uh, other cases of, uh, of trim points that we won't get to now. This is basically a so-called phase portrait uh, when where nonlinear systems are concerned. And this captures, like I said before, the trajectory of the system via propagation. To draw such a phase portrait on a 
on the diagram, you need numerical values essentially. So you do need to have some sort of an idea of a system at hand and replace the variables with numbers. But uh, it is also expected to reflect what the, the linear analysis pointed, at least locally. If your linear analysis said that the origin, specifically the origin, is stable, you would expect the nonlinear phase portrait to behave quasi stably in a neighborhood around the origin. This is pretty, uh, in appearance, to what we saw before as a focus point, but a phase portrait of a of a nonlinear system doesn't have to be. Like it could it could be like this, and this is from a book example of a tunnel diode circuit. It can be completely nonlinear, very weird. Thankfully, we're not at that um, in that case. And at this point, we can apply the core of today's analysis. Uh, this is the so-called Lyapunov's theorem. And it is a sufficient condition that proves that the autonomous system that we have at hand is actually stable in the Lyapunov sense. That's a technical term. The proof comes down to finding a function, an arbitrary function V of the state that needs to be positive everywhere on the domain that we care about investigating. And it needs to be, its derivative needs to be negative everywhere on the domain that we care to investigate. And if those two things happen uh, and we find V that satisfied, satisfies those two conditions, then we can guarantee that our autonomous system is stable. Um, so a naive attempt of the happen of function, um, before I say that, uh, let's uh, say that typically the Lyapunov function V is a representation, is a, is a mirror of the energy of the system. The energy needs to be positive at all times. This is why it needs to be positive as a function. And if its derivative is negative everywhere or zero at the origin, it means that the energy of the system gradually and continuously diminishes so that the system degrades and uh, settles on the origin. So if we use just the sum of the squares of every state of the system as an energy function, that's the most naive approach we can come up with, it yields pretty long um, expressions like the one at the bottom, like you can't draw any conclusion from that. Like, is this always negative? Who knows? Um, but it's it's kind of important to get a good insight on that uh, Yapno function because it also helps you draw conclusions about the conditions for stability for the system. So if I could understand how all of the variables on that derivative work together or they, what relation they need to have with each other so that the whole thing is negative, I could draw conclusions about, okay, if, for example, it says that the arbitrary thought, the product of uh, the text pitch gain, that pitch damping gain and that period needs to be less than 12, then, okay, this is progress. But yeah, this expression doesn't, is really unwieldy. So you can't solve an expression, just calculate it, but you do lose like the flexibility. The moment you want, you replace with numbers, you can get your analysis all the way to the end, but you have lost a lot of insight. In this case, what I tried to do uh, was to keep a two-dimensional system and keep two variables free, basically. The text time constant on the one axis and the text pitch, pitch damp uh, gain on the other axis. And what I did was that I 
evaluated the Lyapunov function derivative all over the domain of a few meters per second up and down on the velocity axis and a few meters up and down on the altitude axis and plotted the maximum of that Lyapunov derivative. And you can see how for some values of uh, the time constant and some values of the damping constant, you get positive uh, values. Like I'm getting them, I'm, I'm, I'm plotting the max of the max. So along that whole um, uh, phase portrait, I take the maximum value basically. And if that's positive, and in, for some cases it is, like we see here, it means that our system oscillates or escapes basically and drives away from the origin. Whereas for some values of the time constant of the pitch damping, it is negative everywhere. The maximum value is negative, so everything is definitely negative. And this means that that system in comparison is more stable. It gets to the origin for sure and probably faster. So what results can we draw from this? Um, yes, we have just shown that with under some numerical values, text is stable. Uh, it, it, it closes a stable loop, and that's a good initial verification for the proposed methodology. Uh, but as we saw, there are a lot of variables to move around and keep track of. Uh, the system was six or seven variables, Texas, another six or six or seven. This amount of variables is like too much to lug around in a mathematical derivation. So we had to use some numerical values to to process this ana this analysis and progress. Um, but we do gain in insight. So we can transfer what we saw before, this image, and take the two the two edge cases, the one on the top left and one the, on the bottom right, those two combinations of parameters, draw these two phase portraits. And you can see that with the right values uh, of text, the phase diagram of the system uh, evolves more quickly towards the origin. Whereas with the, y, with, with the left one, uh, you have a lot of arrows escaping outside of the area of interest, and there is a diagonal line where the system doesn't strongly want to come back to the origin. So that's that's some good insight, and that is some pointer that maybe in the future I should try to see what is the relation between those two constants and why do they behave like this. Um, I used a lot of numbers for this analysis. So for application in real systems, some parameter identification is necessary. And we saw today some pretty good uh, efforts on doing parameter identification. But we didn't have such a complex model to begin with. And I think it would be not easy, but manageable to uh, do some identification not so accurate, and it might be applicable to whole classes of vehicles. So you might have a set of model parameters that represent a sleek glider versus a really chubby biplane with uh, some serious thrust, though. And the last takeaway from this um, talk is that all the math you just saw were done through SimPy. I didn't do it by hand at all. And that means that we can easily modify it. And you can go ahead to that uh, repository, run for yourselves, and see how it works. So what's more to do after this? Uh, of course, I need to keep on studying. I really did not have as much time as I thought before this uh, presentation. I did less than half of what I was planning to do.
Uh, so I need to go back to the books, um, study more relevant applications. Uh, there are a lot of theorems that allow you to simplify your analysis and make you make you less reliant on chugging and lugging around all of those num uh, variables that you can substitute uh, with simpler functions a lot. And another good pointer is the passivity theory that lets you get a modular system, prove that all of your modules of that system are passive. And if they are passive, then the combination of them is going to be passive as well. And this is perhaps for complex systems, a more manageable way to prove stability. And if you indulge me this far, sincere thank you. And you can ask your questions if you have any or remarks, or we can just speed along to the next presentation. We're way behind schedule. Nathaniel was first on the line. Thank you. Um, really cool talk. I think we kind of have the same the same way of thinking about this stuff. It's like, how do you apply the math in useful ways to answer problems on stability and control? And yeah, so um, the main thing I wanted to ask you, it's a bit more heady. It was, what would you say is the most promising direction you've seen for answering how you can generally address nonlinear stability? Uh, the reason I ask is because as far as I know, it's an open problem. Like it's, that's part of why we don't know how to do it. No one's really got a general framework, like a linear system to say it's stable and here's how I know. I think there are enough decades of research on long, non, on nonlinear systems, controls and stability that for us as an our development community, it's a matter of getting enough experience to identify and connect the right piece of research to our systems. We need to identify the category, the class of the systems that we are running to the correct research and how like full-time researchers and professors solved those control problems. Uh, so the general nonlinear stability is yes, an open problem, but the the historical re research has come up with a lot of individual classes of systems where proofs exist and we need to find them. Yeah. And then just to follow on, um, you mentioned at the start how you had plans when you started out <laughs> to publish and whatnot. I just think that's healing after you finish the, the work at the start, right? Like it's a natural part of the process. I had that moment one week ago when I left home because I didn't bring a laptop with me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why I, I have that old RT Pilot logo because Randy dropped this one day after I left home. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Man. Thanks for the question. Oh, and of course, thanks to Tim for lending me his laptop. <laughs> <laughs>